Congratulations! You are tuned into Dolph Barron's Leadership and Loyalty Show, the number one podcast for Fortune 500 executives and those who are dedicated to creating a quantum leap in leadership. Your host, Dolph Barron, he's an executive mentor to leaders like you, a contributing writer for Entrepreneur Magazine, CEO World, and he's been featured on CNN, Fox, CBS, and many other notable sites. Dolph Barron is an international business speaker who was named by Inc. Magazine as one of the top 100 leadership speakers to hire. Now, over to Dolph Barron. Welcome, dear friends, fans, and fellow aficionados of Leadership Excellence. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Leadership and Loyalty Tips for Executives. Let me ask you, what do you need to do to up-level your leadership? In all seriousness, let me ask you, have you considered if we're at a point in our leadership journey where we need to, no, actually, where we must find a deeper level of humanity? Well, stay tuned because that's exactly where we're going today on the show. I'm your host, Dove Baron. I am the Dragonist, and I'm here to assist you tapping into the one thing in your business that changes everything by transforming meaning into action. To find out more about me, you can simply go to DoveBaron.com. That's D-O-V-B-A-R-O-N.com. This episode of Leadership and Loyalty is brought to you in part by the Dragon's Lair. Have you discovered the next evolution for yourself? Imagine being in a virtual classroom where I will personally walk you through the trainings that are previous and techniques and strategies rather that I previously only offered to top CEOs and C-suite executives, high level entrepreneurs, athletes and entertainers. Now you get access to all those trainings with me personally and you'll get the exclusive workbooks that go along with it. You can have all that, and that's what many of our listeners are doing, by simply going over to Patreon, www.patreon.com forward slash Dove Baron. And in just two minutes, you can join us. In fact, you'll even get access to all those past episodes like Ethical Persuasion, Becoming a Meaning-Driven Leader, resilience, Resilient Leadership in a Time of Chaos, and so many more, and you get it all right now. Right away, Dove Baron. Dot com is another way to find us. If you are a new listener, new viewer, I want to thank you for joining us. Strap yourself in. We're about to go full Monty. As always, we need your help in staying relevant. So please get yourself over to wherever you tune into podcasts and just rate, review, and subscribe to the show. We would love that. Thank you so much. If you are a regular listener, a big thank you to you for making us the number one podcast globally for Fortune 500 listeners with a potential reach of 2.5 to 4 million listeners. Over time, we are honored and grateful to be cited by Inc.com as the number one podcast to make you a better leader. All right, let's strip it down and dive right in. Let me ask you, what do you think the World Bank has to do with the changing face of the Amazon rainforest? What does a highly trained economist have to do with indigenous people of the Amazon? Furthermore, what's the connection with all that and you up-leveling your leadership? Well, stay tuned because that's exactly where we're going today. You see, my guest on this episode is John Perkins. He is a best-selling author of multiple books, including The Secret History of the American Empire, Hoodwinked, Psychonavigation, and perhaps his most famous one, Confessions of an Economic Hitman, a book that stayed on the New York Times bestseller list for, wait for it, 70 straight weeks and sold over 2 million copies. That's a dream that most, pub most authors would never even reach. So it's been published in 35 languages. In case you don't know what an economic hitman is, they are highly paid professionals who cheat countries around the globe out of their trillions of dollars. They funnel money from the World Bank and the US agencies um, and other foreign aid organizations into the coffers of huge corporations in the pockets of a wealthy few families who control the planet's natural resources. The tools include fraudulent um, financial reports, rigged elections, payoffs, extortion, sex, murder. I mean, it goes on. They play a game as old as empires and the one that is taken on a new and terrifying dimension during this time of globalization. So I would love for you to put your hands together and help me welcome the author of all those books I previously mentioned and a brand new book called Touching the Jaguar, Mr. John Perkins. Hey, John, good to have you on, mate. Thank you, Bill. That was a quite an introduction, I gotta say it. I'm wondering, so are you expecting me to go full Monty on this show? I didn't. I am, that. mate. I am. <laughs> right down to the panther. 
<laughs> well, we're going to have the full, the full uh, disclosure. How's that? Right down yeah. to the Jaguar, mate. Show us that. Down to the Jaguar. I, I'm willing to take the Jaguar off, but uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, John, I know that um, I want to let our listeners know that actually uh, you and I uh, had a really wonderful in-depth conversation We've spoken before, but we, you, I also had you on my Curiosity Bites podcast. And for those of you who are listening, if you enjoy the show and you really want to get in depth, uh, John and I spent a couple of hours together really digging into to the, the meat of all of this. And you can go over to Curiosity Bites and you can subscribe there and you can listen to that. But for this show, we want to, we want to dive in. And one of the places I always like to start this show with, John, is in this age of influencers, whatever the heck that means, I always want to know... Who is someone who might have been a major influence on you as a leader um, who m most people would probably not know or not suspect? Who's somebody who's had that level of impact on you? Yeah, well, I could name quite a few people sure. that, that everybody would know. Yeah. But one that most people probably wouldn't know unless <laughs> they read my book is Omar Torrijos, who was the head of state of Panama. And Omar was a very controversial figure here in the United States. Uh, he ended up negotiating the Panama Canal Treaty with Jimmy Carter and uh, uh, you know, won the ownership of the canal back to, into the hands of Panama, which upset a lot of Americans, including mm -hmm. Ronald Reagan, who soon after that happened, became president. And soon after Reagan became president, uh, Omar Torrijos, uh, his private plane crashed and what most observers believe was an assassination. But Omar, Omar to me was a great leader uh, because he was willing to stand up for what he really believed in. Mm. And, you know, my job as an economic hitman was to go to Panama and convince him to change his ways, not mm. to fight, win the canal back. But his fight was bigger than that. So basically he was saying, a big country like the United States has no right to try to bully it over a smaller country like Panama. And he, and he took that up to the whole world. He said, this, this stands for all of Latin America. It stands for Africa. It stands for every nation. We may be small, but we're people mm -hmm. and have every right. And, and, and because of that, Omar became a, a, a global hero, especially in developing countries, not in the United States, certainly, where he was vilified, no. basically. <laughs> and so, he was a guy that, that knew that he was putting his life on, 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 on the line. Uh, he had a compatriot, basically, who was Jaime Roldos, the president of Ecuador, mm -hmm. who also was standing up to the United States at the same time. Roldos was wow. saying, oh, it wasn't so much the United States, Roldos was standing up to the big oil companies, which were U.S. oil companies, primarily Texaco in those days in Ecuador, and saying, if you're going to drill for oil in our country, you've got to pay the, America, the, the, the Ecuadorian people a fair share of your profits. And I was sent down to convince him to back off. Uh, he didn't back off, and he, he was killed. His private plane crashed in May of 1981. Right after that, Torrijo said, you know, I'll probably be next. He got his family together, and he said, I'll probably be next. But, you know, don't mourn for me too much because... I have accomplished the most important thing, which is having the Panama Canal Treaty signed. That's, that's a done deal. Mm -hmm. And my brother Jaime was assassinated. He said, I have no doubt he was assassinated and I'll probably be next, but it's okay because I've done my job. So this guy was incredibly courageous. And I have to say, though, that I was in a difficult position because my job was to bring him around. I was supposed to do that. And, yeah. and, and, and I was failing. On the other hand, uh, I had such respect for this man's integrity. And, and I also had a great fear for his life. So I was, it was a very difficult position for me. But I have to say that Omar also, he's the one who basically convinced me more than anyone else perhaps to get out of being an economic hitman. He pointed out to me what I was really doing. I thought I was doing good things. I really believed for a long time I was doing good things. Uh, and he showed me that what I was doing was it was creating a, a very, very strong colonialistic, imperialistic society that the United States was, was, was colonizing so much of the world. And, and my job was to do that, not through the military, but through economics, through debt. And Omar really pointed this out to me, and I always appreciated that. He was a great man. What was that like for you to, you know, because like you said, you're in a, a very difficult position. You had a job. 
um, what you and I talked about in the other show, where you know you genuinely believed you were doing good work initially, at least, and then you meet somebody like this who, by whatever means, suddenly allows you to see that maybe the error of your ways is a way of putting it and that you're actually part of something that is incredibly potentially destructive and you were that was not who you actually were but you became that as a sort of you know i always say that that i don't i don't like the word evil i think that it's a massively overused term but there is a creeping version of that that people find themselves in who are actually good people and what I mean by that is that they, they slowly, incrementally move towards a direction and then realize, geez, I am really in the mud of it here. Is that what that moment, the, the conversation with him was like for you? Yes, uh, very much so. Um, yeah, here I'd been in business school and I'd been trained by the World Bank to believe that investing huge amounts of money making huge loans to countries like Panama or Ecuador or Colombia or many other countries in Af Africa throughout the world, giving them huge loans and then saying, well, they had to use this money to hire U.S. corporations to build huge infrastructure projects in their country. And these corporations are going to make large, large profits, which they did, yeah. coming like Bechtel and Halliburton and Brown and Root and the big engineering firm, General Electric and other companies like that. And... It, and our economic models that we did in business school and, and at the World Bank show that that would increase the GDP, the gross domestic product, the economy of a country. And it does when you invest in big power plants, industrial parks, highways and ports, the, the economy grows. And so I, I'd grown up thinking, well, this is the right thing to do. This is helping everybody in the country. And then over time, and Omar particularly helped me see it's not helping everybody in the country. It's only helping a few rich people because GDP measures the money and economy. And so many people don't live in this money and economy. Plus, only a few individuals make up such a huge proportion. Look, you know, in the United States right now, we've got three individuals who have as much wealth as, as half the rest of the United States. Well, you if, talk to me about how if they lost uh, if, if, if the... If if everybody's economy went down, but theirs only went down a percentage, and theirs went down a percentage, the GDP would still be up because they have so much money, right? Tell it what was that stat? I can't remember what it was. Yeah, I done the numbers. If if those three individuals made ten percent return on their investment last year, and everybody else, and half the half the country lost lost three percent, we'd still show a GDP growth of something around five percent. So. I, and I began to see that these statistics were just totally screwed in favor of the wealthy. They, they, were, they were alive, really. They were not, the, 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 you know, the sh all the ships were not rising with the tide. No. Just, just the big yachts were rising with the tide. The little fishing boats were not. But and, when, you look, when you look at that, John, and you look at that, uh, and let's just take this into very contemporary times, at a simple level, right? So we're not talking about... Uh, the, the nitty gritty of it, but at a simple level, why don't people get that? You know, I, I see that, you know, I'm very political, as you know, and I study these things, as you know, we've talked about this before. And I'm fast, I've always been fascinated by why people vote against their own interests. Um, and it seems to me, and this is my theory, and I'm gonna put it forward to you, and I don't want to hear from you. Um, you and I are old enough to, to be aware of conspiracy theories before they were mainstream. Now we've got this QAnon thing and it's all become very mainstream, the conspiracy. But the problem with it is that there is deep complexity to the simplicity of it. The simplicity of it is the government is corrupt. Okay, but there's complexity to that. And so people are left with not knowing who to trust um, on any side of it. And they end up voting against their own best interests. I'm kind of blown away by that. What, what do you see? Well, we're, I think people are very gullible, first of all. And there's a lot of statistics, there's a lot of studies that show we want to believe good things. We want to believe good things. We, we want to believe goodness in people. And we also want, we, we look for simplicity. We look for simple answers. Yep. Uh, because that, that makes life a lot easier. So if we can believe 
that you know all of our problems are caused by a handful of of people sitting at the top of some sort of you know there's some sort of an odd from the wizard of oz some, something like this if we can believe that then it relieves us of the, of the responsibility of having to go out and shop consciously and do things consciously and and do our work consciously you know and, and i think my case is a good one is an important one to look at from a personal standpoint i had this training i was given this perception so we know though that that our perceptions create our reality absolutely as, as we talked about before there is no there is no united states there's no canada where you are there's no religion there's no culture except as people perceive these things and when enough people accept a perception or codify it into law it has a huge impact on reality it creates canada it creates the united states it's creates religions it's create it creates corporations mm -hmm. marketing you know our, our whole business model is based on selling a perception that if you don't own this jacket you're not going to get a good mate in life right <laughs> or whatever with the creating this perception and and politicians and 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 people who who want to who benefit somehow by writing a book or by making a video or something uh, that, 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 that 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 gives people the perception that there's something evil out there that there's something they it relieves them of responsibility that that is very popular and in my case so i was given this perception i was trained with this perception that investing huge amounts of money in big infrastructure projects, paying U.S. corporations to make big profits to build these projects would help these countries. And there were all kinds of statistics to show it was true. Right. But the statistics were all built on a false perception that GDP measures overall prosperity for people. It doesn't. It measures a few people particularly, you know, those on Wall Street, basically, the ones who own all the stocks. And then once I began to see the problem, I was also sold a perception that the American dream is to make lots of money, to travel first class around the world, to live the good life, and suddenly I'm doing it. I'd grown up as son, of, son of a rural teacher in New Hampshire, not a lot of money, and I was surrounded by very wealthy boys because my dad taught at a boys private boarding school. So I was surrounded by these wealthy kids with these phenomenal stories about the places they lived in, and I never had any money. And suddenly, I'm being paid a very good salary. I've got a huge expense account. I travel first class around the world. I stay in the finest hotels. I want to dine with presidents. And once I began to see what Omar was telling me, I didn't want to believe it. I still wanted to believe the perception that I'd been sold because now I have another perception and that is I'm living a good life. Mm -hmm. And what it took though was for me at one point to realize that I was living on alcohol and and Valium. You know, I was traveling through lots of time zones, taking trips yep. from Austin to Indonesia on a regular basis, halfway around the world. And at night I would drink a lot of alcohol. I'd be in a hotel in Hong Kong or someplace and take 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 Valium. And in the morning I'd have to I have to ply myself with <laughs> lots of caffeine <laughs> just to get going. And then I'd go off and negotiate these huge deals. And then I'd fly back to Boston. And I was incredibly unhappy. I was incredibly unhappy, but I had the perception that what I was doing was making me happy. So for a while, I got stuck with that also. But the, again, that's the, you know, I, I think that's a very interesting piece in the context of leaders and leadership is we're pursuing this nebulous, it's not even, it, it seems very literal and, you know, solid uh, goal. And then when we get there, it becomes quite nebulous. It's like, well, hold on a second. Now I'm supposed to be happy now. Uh, I bought the wife a new set of boobs. I bought myself an extension um, called, called a, you know, this vehicle or that vehicle. Uh, I've got a couple of houses. I've got a yacht. How come I'm a miserable bastard, right? And I, you know, and unhealthy, you know. So I think that that is sold all the way. But it's, again, it's, it, when I look at it and I look at the leaders that I work with, many of them feel like I don't know how to get off. I don't know how to get off. And that for me is what was interesting about your story, John, because you were living the high life. You were the, you know, first class guy, you know, flying first class, living the lifestyle, nice house, all those things. And it wasn't where you were from, which I think is even more enticing because it, 
that I think the dream is sold harder to you if you don't have it. And so you didn't have it. You've now got it all. You're flying first class. You're all over the world. You're meeting with the leaders of the world, whining, dining with them. There's anything you want, money, sex, power, etc., is literally at your fingertips. And you have a realization that this is not for me. That is like tearing off your own flesh. I know because I work with people who go like, yeah, but I don't know how to give this up. I don't know. How, I mean, that is the ultimate neurological drug. I mean, every uh, neurochemical response to that is you are mainline in success and you mm -hmm. cannot pull that, that, that syringe out and go, oh, I'm fine. I'll, I'll go live on some Island in, in, uh, on the West coast and, and, and watch the, watch the birds. <laughs> yeah. Talk yeah. to us about how you gave up that, because like I said, it's like almost like an addiction. How did you do that? It, it is an addiction. And, the, and there's another aspect to it, too. And that is as a leader, I had up to 50 people working for me. Uh, right. I, my, my title was chief economist. I speak so much so you can not get hit men. But I, and um, these were mostly young people. Um, and they had a tremendous respect for me. And I was a good leader, I think, in, in terms of convincing them to produce the kind of studies that would accomplish what I needed to accomplish for the most part, which was convincing these country leaders to take these large yeah. loans and to convince their people they should do it and this whole perception business. And then when I decided to quit, suddenly they were in this position of having to try to convince me not to quit. And it wasn't just because it, it, you'd think that you know, there were a couple of them who would take over my job eventually if I quit. So you'd think maybe they'd be happy about this, but they had a respect for me and I would tell them why I was quitting. Mm. And they, they would have to convince themselves that either I was crazy or they also had to quit. <laughs> if I was right in what I was doing and I was going to quit as a result of it, in good conscience, they would have to quit or they'd have to convince myself that I was crazy. And a few of them, a few of them quit, but most of them convinced themselves that I was crazy, I think. They, or, they just, or they just fell back into it and they went ahead. But it really is kind of like swallowing the Kool-Aid, you know? I mean, we, 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 we are all are swallowing the Kool-Aid yeah. all the time. And you know, it's, it's, leadership is so important in this. Uh, I think, you know, I had the leadership of, of Omar Torrijos. I also had a tremendous respect for the, who, the, the, the guy who founded the Peace Corps, John Kennedy. And, and he, you know, John Kennedy, he, he made a lot of mistakes and you know, he was anything but perfect. But I loved his idea of ask not what, what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. And I went off and joined the Peace Corps before I became an economic hitman when I was out of college. And mm -hmm. I lived in the Amazon and I lived with people whose whole life is devoted to community. They don't have the same concept we have about individuality, about everything's got to be for me. I got if there's a small piece of pie and I to get but to make to get my piece, I got to take somebody else's or to make my piece bigger. I got to take somebody else's. No, they have the feeling that let's all make the pie bigger for our whole community. Let's all do things better for our community. That's that's how we move forward. So I lived with these people for three years and then I became an economic hit man. But I headed in. You know, once Omar Torrijos began to get through to me, I, I, I kind of reverted back to that shamanism thing and, and, and the indigenous people in the Amazon and their concept of what life really means. And also, frankly, my parents, who both came from families that go back to the American, before the American Revolution, and, and I had family that fought in it, very down to earth, teachers who put a lot of faith in, in the, the intellect and mm -hmm. spirituality, if you want to call it, not religion, but, but a yeah. deep sense of spirituality, not money. And, and so I, I had that grounding. I think I was fortunate from that standpoint. I think there's a lot of people today and in my, my time who are in my position that it's much more difficult for them to break free because they don't have the leadership ideas. They don't have people that have given them the alternative perception which is what you're doing right now, incidentally. And I think that's just so important that we, that we do this. Um, I, I, think it's, I think it's vital that we do this because as you said, leadership is in, leadership is in its most coarse version marketing. And what it is, is you're marketing a perception of a vision uh, of somewhere you want to go. And if we have not 
checked that. Um, and, and, and let's face it, you had checked it. You know, you thought you were doing something good. And I think that this is, this is the greatest challenge of all is that people, gen I don't, I believe it's not the truth. I believe people are generally good. I believe that. Um, and I believe that their intentions are good, even when they're doing shitty things most of the time. And, and I think that the problem is that we are so ego identified and that when we're ego identified, when something is proven to be incorrect, we don't want to let it go because we don't want to look like fools. It's the first rule of investment. Don't lose your initial investment. My initial investment is I'm, I'm saving the world by doing this, this work for the World Bank. And yeah. now, oh, maybe I'm not. That's, you know, that's, that's why I said about tearing off the skin because that's the, the, the investment is the most difficult thing for people to give up. You know, my mom's a good person or my dad's a good person. Uh, no, they were actually abusive. I mean, I'm not saying they're bad people, but that was abusive, right? So, no, I can't have that. I have to hold my mother as saintly because my father was, was, the, de was the devil. Mm, not quite like that with <laughs> anything, right? So that for me is, I'm really fascinated by that. And it seems like you may have given us a clue in that you, I mean, obviously you had your, your background as a kid and your parents, but you also have this interesting piece for me is that it went the other way around to what most people would perceive is that you were in the Peace Corps, in the Amazon with those people. Then you almost became their enemy, you know, by virtue of what you were doing. Right. And then you returned to that. So is, do you think that that was it? Do you think that was because you had that grounding that you were able to actually give up the addiction? Yeah, I think that had a lot to do with it. And the fact that, that I had something else that I wanted to do. All my life, I'd, I'd wanted to be a writer. I, as a kid, I wrote stories. I just found a bunch of them that I wrote when I was like in fifth grade, you know, and, and I loved writing. Mm. And, and I had forsaken that to, to go into economics and, and make money. And now I figured, you know, I could go back to the Amazon and, and after I, I left, I could go back and, and hang out with these people that I really respected and wanted to spend time with them and, and write about them. And then eventually, and I did, I wrote five books about shamanism and indigenous people. And then eventually I got into economic hitman stories. Uh, so I had something to drive me forward that, that I was not totally tied to the business that I was in. And you know, I, I have to say though, that I've since talked to a lot of executives, high up executives, CEOs of big corporations. I speak at a lot of big conferences, uh, economic conferences and corporate conferences. Yeah, people should know that the World Bank brings you in to speak, which I think is like the most beautiful irony of all. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and, and Confessions of an Economic Hitman was a big time bestseller at the World Bank books. You right? told me, I was like, <laughs> that is fantastic. Yeah, so, so I get to meet with a lot of these people and I can't tell you how often I hear CEOs saying, I want my company to be greener. I have children, I have grandchildren. I want, it, I want them to have a good life. But I know, know that if I go a little too far and, and my company loses, its stock prices go down or it loses market share or just half a percentage, the main investors will fire me and replace me with someone who only cares about market share or, or stock prices. And so there's another dilemma that these people are in. Like, you know, and, and, and maybe some of them don't, they don't have the same motivation that I had that well we could I could quit and go back to the Amazon and write books right. about it. that's just not in their perception their way of thinking the Peace Corps did that for me you know John Kennedy and and growing up with teachers uh, did those things things for me so I think you know leaders these days are in very very difficult positions but what we really need right now is a lead is leadership to step forward with tremendous courage I, I just was listening to an interview by Bob Woodward, you know, he has this new book course, yep. come out called Rage that's Rage. about yep. amazing interviews with and recordings with Donald Trump. I can't understand why Trump agreed to do this, but it's very interesting that he did. And one of the things Woodward said, which I, in this interview I heard, was he said, you know, I, I think there's many, many countries in the world where I would not be able to write this book and have it published. He said, so I think we can say, 
that uh, democracy is still thriving in the United States, but, but what we're lacking is leadership. We've mm -hmm. lost leadership. We have, we have sort of a democracy, but we don't have the leadership to run the democracy. And well, I think that, that is so important. And, and I think we, we see it in Congress. We see this incredible you know, division be, between, um, between our Democrats and Republicans that nobody can seem to compromise. And also, we see it in the corporations and we see the power of Wall Street, like what I just said, the power of the investors, that a CEO cannot necessarily do what he believes is the right thing because he has to do what the investors want to see, which is short-term profits. So in that context, John, um, with the time we, we've got left, I, I want to make sure that we get to what is your sort of, you know, you get to wave the magic wand and, and give direction to leaders and leadership because, as I said, there are a lot of people who don't trust leadership anymore. They don't trust what it's all about. And, and they're looking at, um, you know, then let's say they're Trump supporters and they're looking at the cabal, the deep state, you know, Club of Rome, whatever one wants to call it. Um, and then on the other side of it is, uh, people who, who certainly don't trust Donald Trump or, or the more um, dictatorial style leadership. Um, and then, as you said, you've got the next level of leadership, which is the, the let's say, the, the business leadership. The, um, but CEOs who are being paid vast amounts of money, more than the people who work inside of the companies, but they're also protecting their asses. Um, so... What's your guidance? Because a lot of people are feeling like they're very pulled and don't know where to go. And, and I've always said that, you know, that the, I really believe with everything, every fire around being psychologically, that the reason we have dictatorial um, leaders coming up in Bolsonaro or, or um, in Brazil, or whether we've got um, uh, the Filipino leader or whoever it is, these leaders are coming up because of a victim mentality. And the victim mentality is we're offended by everything and, you know, you're trying to put the boot on our neck. So now we, it actually creates the other side. So what's your guidance around for, for leaders in business and even in their communities? Well, yeah, I, I think that more than anything, the guidance is for we, the people, we who consume the products, who invest some some of us in stock or whatever mm -hmm. and work for companies and we really need to pressure these companies to do the right thing I, i've had so many executives tell me i want to do the right thing but i don't want to get fired and doing it so please get get your listeners who your readers whoever to to organize consumer campaigns and social networking makes this very easy today mm -hmm. so you know you pick a company you, you pick let's say let's just say Nike, and you, sure. you, you write a letter to Nike and you say, hey, Nike, I love your products, but I'm not going to buy them anymore until you pay your workers in Indonesia a living wage. Right. And, and you're nice. You say, I love your products. I want to buy your products, but I can't. Right. right. And, and you, you, you send that, and you just you send it to Nike, but you also send it to all your social networking circles and ask them to send it to all their social networking circles. And when, when, when Mark Parker, whoever happens to be president of Nike, gets enough of these letters, they've told me, when I get enough of these, I can take them to Phil Knight, our major our founder, and, and, and our major investors, and say, hey, these are our consumers. Uh, these are our customers. We, we've got to listen to them. Uh, and so I think it behooves all of us to get deeply involved in this. Of course, right now we've got an election coming. Kind of, people have to vote. I mean, it's so, so important that we vote. But that not that just that we vote in the polls, the electoral polls, but that we always vote in the marketplace. But it's not just about how we shop. We, we've got to send messages. We've got to change the perception. I bought from this company because it's trying to do the right thing. And you let them know that. And you send that right. out to all your friends. I didn't buy from this company. And you let them know. You send it to all your friends because you're not, they're not doing the right thing. We need to get this message out there. And I think we also need to understand that we do need regulations. We need to, uh, corp corporations should not be able to get away with uh, destroying the environment, period. You know, I mean, the oil companies are, 
are doing this and they're getting tax breaks for doing it. That's, that's, that's ridiculous. And now we've got the situation where we've got social media that, and this is real interesting. I just watched a movie last night called The Social Dilemma, which is very interesting about social media and, and the dilemma that the people in social media are in where they recognize that they've got a great platform. There's a great opportunity here for all of us to communicate better, but there's a tremendous opportunity for the system to be abused. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'd say I'm, I'm a free marketer type of person. I, I don't like regulations a lot, but I watched my, my 12 year old grandson playing soccer. And if you get 11 guys on this team and 11 guys on this team, you get 22 guys out there on the field. And if there's no referee and you just throw the ball off to the, into the field, what, what's going to happen? <laughs> well, it ain't going to be pretty. No, it's not going to be pretty. <laughs> and you're not going to have a good game. You need a referee. And so, you know, we need to, we need to set parameters. And right now we see that we're in huge crisis. You know, I mean, the whole West Coast of the United States is burning up. Australia's on fire, the Amazon's on fire. There's hurricanes coming toward Florida and, and the Gulf of Mexico, and there's constant, you know, I mean, it's just constant, constant. Uh, we're, we're going through an apocalyptic time, there's no question. And then we, on top of all of it, we've got this pandemic. And, and if we've learned anything through all of this, it's that we've got to change. We have to change. And, you know, I talk in, in the book, um, Touching the Jaguar, about how we've got to trans transform the death economy and economic system that's, that's based on the perception that the goal of business should be to maximize short-term profits regardless of the social and environmental cost. That has to change to a perception and a goal that we have to maximize long-term benefits for nature, for, for, for people and for, all, and for the planet, for all of nature. We need to create a life economy that that's based on cleaning up pollution rather than causing more pollution. It's based on regenerating destroyed environments rather than destroying more environments. Recycling, new technologies that, that use solar and wind even more effectively and so on and so forth. This is an exciting time and we're being pushed. We're being pushed and pushed and we need to understand that we must change. Every one of us has yeah. a role to play in this. Every one of us has a role to play in this on some level. I want to ask you because of your background and your uh, experience and uh, of the manipulation of, of, of global econ uh, national economies and eventually global economy. Um, when you look at the things that are happening right <laughs> now, um, whether that's changes in leadership and the leadership styles, um, with, and we, then we look at the things like the pandemic, how do you see that impacting economics um, because a lot of people watching listening who are very interested in the you know their leaders as you said and their economic leaders their business leaders um, who have had to turn on a dime and transform their businesses which i think is actually a good thing and many of them had to go remote which is a good thing um, but do you think that there is some i mean i'm going to be really blunt about it do you think there's some uh, manipulation economically going on, just like there was, you know, like, you know, you talked about in, in uh, Confessions that, you know, the, 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 the weapons of the economic hitman were often, you know, the death of, so you talked about these leaders who were killed. So do you think that something's going on here? Do you think there's a, an economic manipulation around all of this? I mean, I certainly see it at a drug level with the vaccine. Yeah, there's, cert there's certainly an economic manipulation. And, you know, and, and we talk about, if we, do we want to talk about the United States? Do we want to talk about Russia? Do we want to talk about China? They're all different. Uh -huh. uh, but, and so, you know, we tend to be very oriented toward the United States. But right now, the United States is somewhat, ins it's not insignificant at all, but it's less significant today than it was a few years ago because yeah. China's become so important and Russia's become important despite the fact that it's a relatively small economy. It has, it has a tremendous influence in the world. And where India is growing in importance. So we've got to look at all of these things. But all of these economies are mani manipulated to some degree. I think the United States is still in a position to take a leadership role. People still have respect for us. It's deteriorated a lot in the last four years, I have to say. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. whether you like what Trump's done or not, whether you like Trump as a, as a person, if you look around the world, and I try, and up until the pandemic hit, I was traveling constantly in, in Europe, mm -hmm. Asia, and Latin America. 
and we've been hurt, our reputation's been hurt, but we're still looked at as a leader. And so if we can get our act together, we can, we can show the world something. But you know, when we, when we come up with programs that, that bail out, that try to bail us out of this terrible time we're in with the pandemic and the, the, the debt that's been incurred, if we try to bail, out, bail us out of that by putting more and more pressure on the average citizen, uh, we're not a leader and we're not gonna show our, what we can do. You know, we get out of a terrible depression in the 30s and in World War II, at the end of that, part of it by, by taxing the rich, big time, 75% tax rate on, on the rich. Uh, I'm not a big, fa I'm not particularly in favor of big taxes, but there are times when people have to roll up their sleeves and contribute. And if you've made a lot of money, particularly if you've made it off this pandemic, as a lot of these people have, and they're in the news today, you know who they are, particularly mm -hmm. the ones that have been involved in the high tech industry, you know, they've benefited tremendously during this time. I think they owe the rest of us something. I, I think that they, and, and, and taxes for them are a way to do that. But whatever we do, we need to come up with a system that is not, you know, this, this idea of triple down, the, the Reagan economic theory, we've proven that just does not work. And hopefully this pandemic has put the nail in the, in the, the, the final nail in the coffin of that idea of triple down, it doesn't work. Triple up does work. Well, we, I, we I, agree, I, agree, I agree with you, John. I don't think it works at all. But again, I'm back to this thing around people voting against their interests. Yeah. I mean, I'm seeing people who are clearly not very well off from not very well off parts of the country who are supporting a president who made massive tax cuts for the ultra wealthy mm -hmm. and, um, and is looking to, to really damage the healthcare system that would impact the, the, the poorest of the poor. It, it seems like this is like, I'm banging my head on the wall here. Like, what is going on? Why are you voting against your own best interest unless you believe there's some conspiracy? And not only that, but it's a president who has not been willing to say that if he loses the election, he'll, he'll have a, 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 a good transfer of power. No, but that's what those people are still good about. They're still like, oh, yeah, we'll support him in this. I know. I, yeah. So it, it, that for me is the interesting psychology of this whole situation. And, yeah. I, and I had this discussion with a very good friend of mine, um, even in the Bush era, when I talked about people voting Republican against their best interests. I, I, it's not about being Republican or Democrat. It was looking at, okay, well, who's poor and who's voting for less tax on the rich and more tax on the poor and less um, social programs for the poor why would you vote for that? It's not about me looking at it as a Democrat or as a Republican, but looking at it as, I just find that fascinating. It's like, hold on a minute, let me just cut my leg off because I want to take the, the stump and hit you in the head with it. Like, come on. Yeah, it's, it's, it's disturbing. That, that, that's who we are as humans, I think. It's ultimately that there's this, there's this um, ability to close our eyes and to buy into things that, that rationally we know are ridiculous because we, we, we buy into the theory. It's, it, these things become like a religion. Yes. And, and religions have always known the power of just persuading people irrationally about things. And I'm not, I'm not, standing, I'm not opposing religion. I'm a very spiritual person. Mm -hmm. But I am saying that most religions throughout history have used their their orthodoxy have used their concepts to gain personal power for certain individuals and more money for the church and more money for this and that um and they've been very successful at it and Absolutely. and political parties do the same things the republicans have been extremely successful in the united states of of, of selling a line and, and and frankly i don't understand how some of these senators republican senators can continue to support a president these are not dumb people these are many of them are very intelligent. They've been around a long time. They've been in politics a long time. How can they let a president get away with implying that even if he loses the election, he may not abandon the White House? How can they let him continue to get away with saying that if you know if you drink peroxide or, or Clorox or something, you won't get, get, catch the virus? I mean, it's some of these things are just so absurd, but he gets away with it and, and they support it. And therefore people then buy into it. And yeah, I, I think Dove, what, 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 Dove, what we can say about this is that there's always this 
part of the population that's just willing to buy into anything, uh, no matter how absurd it is, if it seems to support their, emo their anger, you know, that the, the, the title of, uh, of Woodward's new book is Rage. You know, there's this, mm. this, you know, and in the United States today, there's this rage and it, it yeah. brings people to be, the, to be fascist or, or to be violent anti-fascist. It brings people to, to do these outrageous things and it drives a, a lot of the Bush support, uh, excuse me, a lot of the, the Trump support. It drives Trump this incredible rage and that gets channeled into things that are just totally counterproductive and also against the people's self-interest who support them. But a lot of that rage is embedded in fear. Yes. And, and the whole theme of Touching the Jaguar, that book is about really facing our fears. And, and I think that the greatest fear we face is the idea, not the truth, but the idea we have about what our society is and the potential of losing that. And on both sides, whether you're extreme left or you're extreme right, that's the fight. The fight is you crazy people over here are going to take away our, our perception, as you said before, our perception of reality, and we're terrified of that. And then they're saying, well, you people over here are threatening to take away our perception of reality. You know, we gotta make America great again. Now, when was the great? Because I'm not sure, was that, during the civil rights protests, because that was also the summer of love, but it was also the summer of brutality. Which one is that? You know, well, I actually prefer to focus on the summer of love. Well, that's fine, but if you're a black person with a boot in your head, not so easy. You know, I mean, it's, that's for what it is for me. It's, it's the willingness, and this is what I, I really believe, it's the willingness to step in and look that that jaguar eye to eye look into the eye of your own fear and face that and i, I i'm really i know we're out of time but i'm really fascinated to know what your best advice is before we finish what your best advice is for those people who maybe because i don't think people even understand fear they don't know that they're in fear but maybe you're getting a taste of like hmm Maybe I'm afraid to give up something because that's the way you notice fear first is the, the fear of loss. Some, I might have to give up something. That's why they're saying long-term shitty relationships because there's this one little element that's kind of nice. She, she, she always makes fish and chips on Friday and I love fish and chips. If the relationship is over, when am I going to get good fish and chips again? Uh, the relationship sucks. Um, well, he beats the snot out of me every week, but every now and then he brings me flowers and you know, I, I, I better the devil, you know, I mean, and I think that that's a lot of it. Yeah, and I think we need, you know, the, the subtitle of the book, I just put up here, that I love the Jaguar here. And yep. Transforming fear into action to change your life in the world. Yes. And I guess, you know, we are pretty short on time, but the short answer is read the book because in the book, there's a, there's a, there's a daily practice that each one of us can take. And basically that, and that asks you the question, what is it you, reader, most want to do for the rest of your life? What will mm -hmm. bring you the greatest joy, the greatest satisfaction? And that could be being a carpenter, could be being a writer, could be being a parent, it could be being a teacher, whatever it is. It could be being a plumber, whatever. But, and how do you relate that to the larger world is another question. And the third question is what gets in your way? What's stopping you? What's the Jaguar? What's the barrier that's stopping you? Oh, I don't have enough time to write. You know, I, I can't be a carpenter because I haven't learned the skills properly. And then how do you change that perception? What do you do to change that perception? And when you change that perception, it gives you the power to take actions every day to make it happen. And so there's this whole process that we go through in, in this, and it's, it's a, like seven or eight minutes, and you can do it every day, or you can do it once a week or whatever. But I think each one of us can go into our own fear, which is often the fear of change. Yes. It's the fear, it's the fear of failure, or maybe it's the fear of success. Yep. The fear of change is the fear that, well, if I do this, if I take this step, yeah, yeah, if I take this step, I'm not going to get those flowers anymore. I'm not going to get the fish and chips anymore, <laughs> you know? So how do we confront that fear? You got to go out and touch that Jaguar, touch that fear, and then you get information. Oh, my goodness. Well, you can buy fish and chips at the store down the street. You know, I can buy flowers down there. Or maybe the next guy that I date, I can insist that he brings me flowers every week or whatever. 
you know, I mean, there's, there's so many ways around that. I have a friend who's a carpenter. He wants to spend the rest of his life working with wood in his hands because that's what he loves to do. But he also wants to help the world by doing it with sustainable materials. But his, his fear is, well, I, my, my clients won't pay the extra price for sustainable materials. But when he did this process and he went out and touched that Jaguar, he said, oh my goodness, I saw the Jaguar told me that, tell your clients, they're not, they're, they're not uh, that this is not a cost. This added price, it's not a cost, it's an investment in the future, their future and the children's future. And so, you know, we can all look at things like this and, and, and how we do that. I think each one of us can take these steps. And so I would encourage people to really go deep in themselves. This, this book could help them, but oddly and I encourage them to, I encourage them to read that book because it, it is about confronting that Jaguar. It is a, a process of understanding. That. I mean, you know, your writing is fabulous and it's a completely engrossing and, and you do a great job of that but aside from anything else that message is so important john we're out of time i know you've got to go and i've got to go so please tell our listeners our viewers where they can find out more about you and all your wonderful resources thank you thank you Joe. and i just want to say i love what you do and let's do it again let's do another one and and, and thank you so much for for doing this and taking this uh, this opportunity to help people become better leaders johnperkins.org and also you can learn more directly about the book at the touchingthejaguarbook.com. But my website, johnperkins.org has it all. I'm on Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, if, if that continues, Instagram, all of those He's things. even on TikTok. <laughs> That's um, fantastic. I get, I get some great one minute videos on TikTok, really about China, about the corporatocracy, about big corporations. And, oh and my God. A lot, a lot of hits, but- You're a rock star, mate. You are a rock star. That may be gone. Stay with, us to, stay with us to the very end, John. We just got to say goodbye to everybody. I want to thank everybody for being on today. And remember that you can hang out with other conscious leaders and chat about this episode or any past episodes inside of our Facebook and LinkedIn groups. Just look for the Leadership and Loyalty podcast. To find out more about how you can hire me, Dove Barron, as a speaker or leadership strategist for you or your organization, go to DoveBaron.com. Because unified meaning, or as we call it, finding your dragonfly is the single most monolithic difference between mediocrity and greatness in all individuals and companies. I want to thank you for sharing the show with everybody you know. Till next time, stay curious, my friend. Stay curious about how you can reach out and touch that Jaguar and transform your fear into power. I'm Dov Barron. I'm here to assist you tapping into your Dragonfire to reach that next level of clarity, focus, purpose, and profit in your business, your life, and your leadership impact. And I am out.